Kate Cunningham returns and drops 32 points against the Timberwolves, but Detroit still lose. We're going to talk about his play as well as the ongoing issues with this team in just a moment. Passing lane, sky's a jam. Dynamite dunk and the crowd loves it. Welcome back to Pearson's Intellect. I'm your host, Jack Kelly. You can follow me on Twitter at Jack underscore Kelly underscore 313. And before we get into today's show, as always, please hit that subscribe button. We're about to hit 900 subs. Still want to try my best to get to 1,000 before the end of the season. Uh, as well as you can support us over on Instagram and, as I mentioned, on Twitter. Now, today's show is going to be... Probably a bit of a quicker one, but we're going to try and keep it brief. Uh, and I think where everyone wants to start with in this game was Kay Cunningham's return. Uh, he was listed as questionable for the past day and a half. We weren't sure if he was going to play. He's obviously missed the past two games with that knee soreness. And it has been, as I said in my last video, impossible to watch this team in the past two to three days uh, without Kate in the lineup. So to find out he was going to play tonight was obviously, you know, as disappointed as we all are with this team. For those that are still sticking it out, like myself and probably many of you watching tonight, uh, seeing Kate in the lineup obviously got us excited, gave us a reason to tune in and a reason to watch this 12 and 61 team play in Minnesota against the T-Wolves who are currently third in the West, but they're only a game behind first and have the best defense in the NBA. So K tonight drops 32 points and goes 11 of 23 from the field, three of eight from deep and seven of eight from the free throw line. Kinda was doing it all. He had 12 in the first quarter, uh, hit a few mid range shots, knocked down a couple of threes and yeah, that, kind of carried over to the second quarter where he scored like a few points. But then the third quarter, once again, he went off. Uh, He had like 28 or 25, 26 through three quarters. Finishes with 32 um, and just looked awesome. Like I said, against the number one defense in the league, Cade scores 32 of the Pistons, 91 points. He finishes the game with a minus six plus minus. And honestly, he was... He had the ball the whole time he was on the floor for or most of it, I should say. Uh, we'll get to Marcus Sasser later. But uh, when Cade had the ball, good things happened. He only played 29 minutes, so scored over a point per minute. Uh, he was extremely aggressive. I think he's still going to tighten up his finishing a little bit, but like, you know, first game back, I'm not too concerned. I, I'm If he's going to shoot 11 or 23 from the field and get to the line eight times, you know, I, I can live with him missing some layups or... Not layups. He doesn't miss like the easy ones, but like I just feel like some of his left-handed finishing that is an area for improvement. But you know, he, I'm not going to get on that tonight. Um, it was it was nice to see him put up that 32 because just before he was listed out with that knee injury, he'd been struggling after coming out of the All Star break really hot. Um, and yeah, like he had Jaden McDaniel's defending him. Uh, and sometimes go bears around the basket. Uh, the the Timberwolves just have so many good defenders. Like even Mike Conley, like I thought to end, to end the first half, K got fouled. Um, but, you know, Mike Conley played some pretty solid defense on him. And um, yeah, like they've just got so many defenders across the board, like even off the bench, like, Alexander Walker is just another wing size player. Uh, he killed the Pistons tonight with threes. Um, Carl Anderson, just another big body. Um, TJ Warren even played Minnesota. Like they just got so many wings and so much size. And like obviously Carl Anthony Townsend played tonight. So these are the teams Cade traditionally struggles against. Like teams that have really good rim protectors and kind of bigger wings that can just load up on Cade. Like he normally struggles. Like, um, Probably not the best example, but someone like Miami, who's like the Heat. K has had some good games this season, but throughout his career, he's traditionally struggled against the Heat because they have a really good, def- like one of the best defensive centers in the league in Bam. They can throw Jimmy Butler at him. They can throw um, 
is it Caleb Martin? I don't know. One, one of the Martin twins who we all know. Um, they just have like size. So he, he normally struggles against these sorts of teams, but to see him come out tonight and hit 32 points. Um, and when he was on the floor, keep the Pistons in this game. And they even had the lead at one point. I think it was in the second or third quarter. Um, but, you know, I think this leads me to my next point. Um, unfortunately, Cade checked out. I think it was at some point towards the end of the third quarter, he checked out. I want to say like the three-minute mark. Pistons were down two points. Uh, they went into the halftime down like two points as well. So they had kept the score even. And remember, they're in Minnesota against the Timberwolves on their home floor. So to be down two towards the end of the third quarter uh, against this team was a huge win. But unfortunately, which this brings me to my next point, um, the bench came in and the Pistons went from being down two to like once K checked back in. I, th- I think they will down by like 12 to 15 points with like seven minutes to go. And as has been the case numerous times after this all-star break, like when K's not on the floor, this team just is horrific. And it's not as big as a, a surprise or as frustrating as it is tonight. It's like, you know, the Pistons literally, they are the six players off the bench, three of them, uh, there's a couple of G-leaguers, one's Evan Fournier, one's Malachi Flynn, Wiseman. Like, it's just you're bringing in players who I honestly don't think would be getting minutes on 28 to 29 other teams in the league. Like, seriously, Buddy Beheim, Troy Brown Jr., James Wiseman, Malachi Flynn, Evan Fournier, and Jared Roden, I genuinely don't think will be getting minutes on any other team in the league. Um, but that's no shade to them. It's just the state of the Pistons, and it's why, unfortunately, when you put in those guys, like, they're just, they, they are not equipped to go up against a team like the Timberwolves, who, as I said, even if they've got a couple of injuries, they are going for a championship. And predictably, they absolutely killed the Pistons in those minutes. And, yeah, like I said, the Pistons were starting uh, Metu, Tosan, Sasa. Like, the lack of NBA talent on this team, it is atrocious. Like, I, And I'm not going to go on a tangent like I did. Watch my last episode if you want to hear a full-on rant about the lack of NBA talent. But, like, it is, like... Oh man, like you, you just watch it and you're just like, what? Like, and, and I'm trying my best to be respectful of the these players because like they are all great players in their own right and have worked extremely hard to get to this level. I mean, no disrespect, but it is like as a fan that sat through this stuff for four or five years now um, and obviously going back to like, my entire time being a fan, it is like, it is hard to sit here, be calm, be patient. I've done that for the past three years. Uh, I can't do it anymore. So like it's, it just comes out of me now. So it is just inconceivable that this is the roster that is put around Kate Cunningham and the Pistons is just failing their franchise player. They failed him in the off season, just gone. Like I admitted in the last episode and I want to make sure I'm accountable I actually didn't mind the Pistons off season last summer. I was completely wrong. And looking back on it now, uh, it was a complete failure to not bring in any real talent on the wing or shooting talent on the wing that can help Cade um, and that can actually defend on the other end. Just to have the worst wing rotation in the league, have uh, outside of Stu when he plays at the five, to really have, you know, very subpar defense at the center position. Uh, yeah, to not kind of fortify any of that and give this group any defensive grit or any real consistent shooting was just an absolute failure. Um, and, you know, it's okay if I'm wrong. It's okay if you're wrong watching this. It's okay if a beat reporter's wrong. It's okay if someone in the media's wrong. But when you are the general manager of the team, when you are in that front office making these roster decisions, it is not okay to get this wrong after you've already had three off seasons prior to figure it out. It it is not okay to finish year four 
with probably the least wins in franchise history. Like that feels like it's going to happen. To finish in year three and year four of your rebuild with the worst records in the NBA is not okay. So I said in my last video, change in the front office has to be top of the list. Priority number one. If you want to change the coach, by all means, I'm open to that. I think I, I personally will be okay if Monty comes back next year. I don't think he's as bad a coach as we've seen. Uh, I think you need to, if you're going to keep Monty, you need to obviously build this thing around Cade, but you need to ensure you have more veterans, more NBA level rotation and starting caliber players to go into next season. You know, even, even if the Pistons, um, this is just my opinion, you might disagree, but even if the Pistons get rid of Monty this off season, bring in a new coach and a new front office, like in my opinion, Cade's going into year four. I think you can keep, I think Cade and Asar, uh, I've really come around on Asar lately, and that's probably more to do with um, Duran and Ivy's struggles. Um, but I think Cade and I, uh, Cade and Asar are the untouchables, or Cade's untouchable and then Asar's pretty close. Duran and Ivy, I would be okay with moving one of them this offseason if you have to move them to get, say, like, Imagine there's a deal the Pistons can get Mikael Bridges from the Nets. You bring him back. Um, well, you bring him back. You bring him to Detroit. If you have Monty or not, that'd be a little thing right then. But if you can get someone like him and it means you've got to give up your first round pick and then you have to move one of Ivy or Duran because you don't have the first round picks to move, um, then, yeah, I, I, I don't mind it. I, I, I'm down for something like that because I think from what we saw tonight, you need to surround Cade immediately with talent that can help you win games. You can't – like, I this this might be too reactionary. This might be too much like I'm in the bubble. I watch only Pistons basketball. It's hard for me to zoom out. But, like, I just don't see the core four really actually meshing long term. But more so, like, I don't think you can – the plan for next season can be to finish in the bottom three. And just as Troy Weaver said, just be competitive. Like, cause you weren't competitive this year. Like your goals need to be higher. You can't, I don't think you can do next season and get like 27 to 30 wins. Like you need to win like 33 to 36 next season. In my opinion, if with Kate Cunningham, like just because you had another down year and whatever, like it was okay last year to take a step back. But you can't just go, okay, well, we won 12 to 13 games this season. Next season, we've only got to win 25. That's improvement. Like, no, you've got to make a huge leap. Um, unless a new front office comes in and they want a fully clean house, um, then that's a different story. But for me, uh, you clean the front office as much as you can. Uh, I don't mind if you keep Monty for another season, give him another opportunity to work with Cade. He's had success with Chris Paul in the past. And I feel like Cade is of that mold uh, of a Chris Paul. So maybe those two can continue to work together and help. They can build the roster um, to make it more equipped to accentuate Cade and also help Monty actually coach a roster he's equipped to coach. Um, some might dis disagree with that, but it is what it is. Anyway, I'm going to move on. I ended up doing a bit of a rant. Let me know in the comments though. I think what I want to hear from you guys, the listeners and viewers, is what, in order, rank what moves you would like to see. So I think for me, it goes number one, front office. Maybe you don't clean it out, but that needs change. Number two, for me, is drastic change to the roster. And then number three would be coaching because I just think – the coaching piece of this, like Monty has been extremely disappointing, but like I think you have to give it maybe another season. You don't have to, but I, I'm cool with giving it another season because you've just cleaned out all the coaches. Like let them try with a roster that they – like they didn't have much time to prepare last off season. Like they did, but they didn't. They probably didn't have much say uh, in how the roster is going to be built. So I'm willing to give them another – off season to work with some of the young guys. But um, for me, front office, number one, and then 
the roster needs serious change. So let me know your one, two, and three of how you'd rank those. Uh, we're going to finish the episode out talking about Marcus Sasser. I'm still high on Marcus Sasser. I don't think he's a starting player in the NBA. So I'll just get say that off the top of the bat. Uh, he's obviously starting because Jaden Ivey's out. And uh, the Pistons are quite depleted with injury at the moment. But, yeah, I think his shooting potential and shot creation is extremely valuable. And I do still think there's a good defender in there. But tonight, I'm not going to sit here and defend him because it's kind of been a bit of a theme the past four or five games. Since this, the, the, the season has started to go in a real negative direction again, feels like Marcus's play, he's He's always been, he loves ISO. He loves taking step backs. He loves creating off the bounce. So that's always going to be a part of his game. If you don't like that type of ball, you, you're not going to, you're never going to like Marcus Sass's play style. So I'm not going to argue with those people or make the argument to them. But uh, tonight he had seven points, two of them from the field, only the one turnover. Says he has five assists, but tonight he really over dribbled. And tonight he also had plays where, not only did he overdrew before shooting, but he missed someone like Cade. Or, you know, there was a play, uh, Cade swung the ball to Sasa and was directing him to pass it to Wiseman, who had a mismatch down low. Sasa completely had the blinkers on, missed all of it, ends up jacking up a really tough shot. That's the kind of stuff where, like, he's a rookie, hasn't been in the NBA long. So, you know, you hope that's not going to continue on all the time. But... I think the concern there for some is that Sasa is going to turn, I think he is 23 already. So he's a very, he came out as a senior from the University of Houston. So, you know, I think Marcus Sasa, I'm not saying he's a finished product, but some of these trends where he's, you know, his passing and playmaking kind of feels very limited at times. It's a bit concerning with just how old he is, but in saying that he's, hasn't played a lot of NBA basketball. So it's kind of tough to just say, oh, well, he's never going to improve there because he's nearly 20. He's going to be 24 years old next season. Like, I think that's rough. Um, I think what's disappointing though is like the three-point shot because I actually, um, you know, I don't think he's a starting level player and that's because of the lack of playmaking and just the, the lack of size. Like um, you need a bigger guard who can defend alongside Cade. Um, so I don't ever see him starting alongside K, but I saw those two being a, like I see them still being a really dynamic duo that you can put in against bench lineups when Cade's not with Ivy or whoever that future guard might be. But um, he's not hitting his three ball. Like it's really tough to keep him on the floor because he needs that three ball um, to obviously draw gravity, but just to make defenses pay if they want to trap Cade. Um, so and, and I think tonight he really struggled against the size of Minnesota, for sure. Like, I think where he can create immense separation on his step backs, but when you're being defended by, like, all these lengthy type players that the Timberwolves have, you don't create as much space as you normally would. And he also, he normally has a really nice floater um, tonight. He just couldn't get it going. Like, he got into the paint once with a floater and it got absolutely volleyball blocked by Gobert. Um, so I'm still a huge fan. I'm still, I was really happy the Pistons got him draft night. I, I know, you know, the fan base is pretty divided on him, but I still very high on him. I still think in there is that kind of combo creating guard who can come in, in a playoff series and really just be an X factor. And, um, I believe like, there's stats to show he's one of the best rookie shooters. He's one of the best up until maybe the past five games. Like he was one of the best pull-up shoot, shooters in the NBA. Like that is valuable. So it's easy when you see games like tonight where he struggles and the playmaking really, or the lack of playmaking really stands out easy. I can see why fans are frustrated, but all I would say is just give it, you know, you can't give him another couple of seasons, but I think, you know, this is a guy that dropped 40 points in summer league. This is a guy that's, you know, scored 20 points five, six times this season. He scored 26 against the Milwaukee Bucks earlier in the season and we were all loving him. 
So don't forget those moments just because he's having a bit of a down stretch. Every player's had their down stretch. And I think Marcus tonight is playing in a, a role. This team's asking to play in a role where he's not equipped for. So, um, or not equipped to consistently perform it. So, yeah, I wouldn't throw all your Marcus Sasser stock out there. We know, I know I'm keeping all of mine. So that's where I'm going to end the episode. Let me know your thoughts on the game. Shout out to everyone who continues to watch my show or our show. And shout out to everyone who continues to watch the games. Go to the games. If you're at the game in Minnesota tonight, let me know. I'm sure you would be at least be happy that Cade put up 32. But, um, yeah, we're almost there, Pistons fans. How many games we got left? We've got nine games left. So I'm going to try and enjoy them as much as I can. I'm glad to see Cade back out on the floor. Duran played tonight as well. Don't have a lot to say on his performance, but um, hopefully those two stick in the lineup. Um, and yeah, we can talk about Kate Cunningham at least till this season's over. So uh, until the next episode, uh, as always, go Pistons. Go Pistons.